Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, and uh, yes, as, as, as has been trailed, I am in fact a rude mechanical, um, uh, but these days I'm also a senior civil servant and I live at the politics railway reality interface, which can be quite an interesting place. Anyway, look, um, I should start by saying um, uh, to all those of you who are from England uh, and, and further afield, indeed, a very warm welcome to Scotland. I'm absolutely delighted that you have chosen, uh, the PWI has chosen to have its electrification conference here. Uh, and I should also say um, uh, to those who've travelled through from Edinburgh, a warm welcome to Scotland. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's really, really good to see you all here. Um, I think uh, I'd, I'd also just uh, say that, that, that things are, you know, this is a different country and things are different here. We do things differently. I'm not referring, of course, to our famous pioneering work in fusion cuisine, like the tempura Mars bar and the haggis pakora, marvellous though they are, and I hope you may get to try them while you're here. Uh, but no, actually, we do have very distinctive policies for uh, the way in which we approach uh, transport uh, generally and rail in particular. Um, now, I'm, and I'm going to try and uh, explain to you a little bit about why we have those different policies, what they are, and why that leads us inexorably to a commitment to a rolling program of electrification. I'm not going to touch on the engineering because my learned colleague, Mr. Ross, will follow me immediately and, and, and do, that, uh, do that rather nicely. Uh, but let's see uh, how we go. So, that's me, but you already know that. Um, so, for those of you not familiar with, uh, with Scotland, it is actually quite a big place. Um, it's about 11% of the GB railway network by almost any measure. Uh, 358 stations at the last count, but there'll be another one in a few days' time and several more on track. Um, and since 2005, the Scottish Government has invested consistently, and, that, and 2005 is the date of devolution of rail responsibility to the Scottish Government. Uh, the Scottish Government has invested consistently in the development of its railway system and network. Um, uh, we're not immune from, uh, from COVID, and, and, and as you've said, it is a bit of a nuisance. I can confirm that the official policy of the Scottish Government is we are against COVID, um, just for clarity. Um, but uh, what it has done is um, uh, it has, has, has a dramatic effect on our passenger volumes, and not just in total numbers, but in character. Um, so we are getting a lot more discretionary uh, leisure travel. Saturday is now the busiest day on the railway. PWI, please note, closing the railway at the weekend is a very silly idea. Um, and uh, uh, freight is uh, growing wonderfully, very strongly, and I think we're going to be embarrassed by freight demand over the next few years. Um, but we spend, uh, on the railways of Scotland, well, currently we're spending about a billion and a half a year. Um, normally, it would be about a billion a year pre-COVID, pre which tells you something about what's happened to railway finances in that period. But we don't spend that money because we happen to like trains. Though if you were to press me, I would concede that I do. We spend it because uh, it delivers against this purpose. This is the purpose of the Scottish Government. And it's all about creating a successful country with opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish through increasing sustainable economic growth and doing that in an inclusive manner for the communities that we serve. And railway investment uh, works very well against that purpose. And even in the middle of uh, the pandemic, the importance of thinking ahead to how we rebuild uh, the transport system of Scotland was clear to us. And as the First Minister just uh, in 2020, actually, committing us to uh, the, the construction of a greener and indeed a fairer Scotland um, at the end of uh, the pandemic. And we have been working throughout this period to continue to make progress. Um, uh, we have a joined up transport strategy. I'll just allow those of you from England to, to, to take a moment to take that in. Um, but we do have a national transport strategy. Uh, in fact, this is the second national transport strategy um, as we have refreshed it. And you'll see that we have uh, these hierarchies. We are trying to hit those core strategic objectives of the Scottish Government about reducing inequalities, taking climate action, delivering inclusive economic growth, and improving health and well-being. Again, railways generally, electrification works for all of those. But we're also utterly committed to this hierarchy of the type of transport we are trying to encourage. Walking and wheeling, then cycling, then public transport, uh, and uh, leading to a reduction in the use of the private car and indeed the lorry. Um, 
Uh, we do all this with our colleagues across Team Scotland in the railway industry, and we do work in partnership with our colleagues in NetRail and ScotRail and the wider rail industry, because we find that uh, when we take decisions together, we take better decisions and we take them quicker, and then we get on with the business of implementing them. Um, but our kind of, we talk about the ABC of, of, uh, of Scotland's railway. We need alignment of objectives with that Scottish Government purpose, but across the whole railway system and with the allocation of government funding. We need to build on the success of Scotland's railway system. It is a successful railway. We have to deliver a competitive railway. We have to attract people, uh, passengers and freight customers, to want to use the railway. And a competitive railway is attractive services delivered at an affordable and attractive price. Um, and that's where, uh, the, the, that's where engineers come in to ensure we are delivering an affordable railway. And to the ABC of our railway, we add the D of decarbonisation. And this is why. So these are the emissions uh, to be uh, found from transport across, all transport across Scotland. Transport comprises something like 37% of all emissions from the Scottish economy. And it has remained stubbornly high. So whereas there's been a transformation in power generation uh, and emissions from power generation, uh, one of the two sectors, the other interestingly is agriculture, that has just remained stubbornly high with its emissions is transport. Now the good news is rail is only 1.2% of that 37%. So congratulations, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, you are on the side of the angels. Um, uh, but we need rail to do more. Um, uh, and actually, we commissioned some research about well, what does this all mean? We're talking about decarbonising by 2030 and our 56% reduction. What does that mean? Well, this is not something to be done in five and ten years' time. We have to be cracking on with this now. Um, we really do need to be making a lot of progress, uh, as indeed I think you'll find that we are. And here, I'm sorry if you can't read all of those figures at the back, but. But to get to the reduction in emissions from transport that we need, we need changes in modal use. It's not just about converting petrol cars to battery cars. That won't crack it. We actually need to change the, the, the modal share of total transport. Um, and you'll see an interesting figure of plus 57% uh, required for rail passenger services. Now, I don't know whether it'll be 57% or 54% or 63%, but the point is, uh, we have to grow, and we can only do that if we can afford to grow. So we talk in Scotland with our colleagues across Team Scotland about our three priorities of uh, net zero, net cost, and safety. And you can't get to net zero if you don't get the net cost right. Um, and we don't just talk about decarbonising rail. Rail sits within that overall transport system, and we have ambitious targets for decarbonisation of all of the modes. Broadly speaking, it seems to me in Scotland, if it moves, the Scottish Government through Transport Scotland pays for it somehow. So, I mean, we are the trunk road authority. We do run the ferry network, uh, uh, almost all of it. Uh, we provide very nearly 50% of the funding of the buses, rather more in recent years. Uh, so, so we really have an interest in this uh, being made to work. Um, now, the good news is, back to that, um, uh, back to that, you're already on the side of the angels. Um, uh, there's uh, one of the um, uh, Tesco uh, container trains on its way to Inverness, I think, uh, on the Highland Main Line, uh, rather splendidly. Um, we're already doing well with diesel traction, um, but the point is we can do better. And it's not just about the emissions, it's actually, if you go back to that growth, we actually need the improved performance, uh, you know, from good to better, we need the improved performance that electric traction will deliver. And we think as much about freight as we do in passengers. There is going to be a very substantial growth in rail freight over the next five to ten years in a manner that I think is going to surprise a lot of people. Um, uh, and the only way we will get that freight traffic onto our existing mixed traffic networks is if we are running longer trains faster. And the only credible way of doing that is with electric traction. Um, so, uh, we do link uh, our strategy through our allocation of resources to infrastructure projects. We have just pub published our Strategic Transport Project Review 2. Yes, this is the second one since 2005. Um, it has a very substantial commitment to investment in rail, promotion of rail freight, and, in and confirms uh, and, and reaffirms, in fact, our commitment to 
uh, an electrification <coughs> programme on the railway network of Scotland. Indeed, again, um, even in uh, 2021, uh, the height of the pandemic, um, uh, sorry, in 2020, sorry, in the height of the pandemic, uh, we still went ahead and published our decarbonisation action plan. Now, just for clarity, this is not a rail industry recommendation to government about why electrification is a good idea. This is the Scottish government providing an instruction to the rail industry in Scotland that we want to get on with this. Um, and that's an important distinction. I have to say, um, I don't see, didn't, didn't find any of my colleagues in the rail industry in Scotland objecting to that, by the way. Uh, and this was a team effort producing this document. Um, our principal aim, we always joke, we say, how do you spell decarbonisation in, in Scotland? You spell it E-L-E-C-T-R-I-F-Y. Um, that's how you spell decarbonisation. Now, we won't be able to, to electrify the entire network as quickly as we would like. And I don't think we will actually uh, electrify all of the network because it's not exactly a new thing in the annals of railway investment, is it? Electrification is capital heavy up front but delivers revenue growth and operating cost savings. That works on a busy railway. Um, even in my wildest dreams, I'm not quite sure I can see a business case for electrifying the far north line uh, given, given the length of the miles involved and the, the lack of traffic density. So we are continuing to look at other uh, alternatives to pure electric traction. We will be buying a fleet of battery electric uh, multiple units in the next small number of years uh, as, part the, as part of our, our migration plan and we are uh, actively cooperating in the development of hydrogen fuel cell train technology um, uh, because we see a future for that. But I have to say um, uh, only on small parts of the network. That is never going to be the right answer for our trunk core busy routes. Um, we do uh, uh, understand that to get the net cost that we require, we have to commit to a rolling program of uh, investment. That brings an awful lot of benefits. Um, we also understand that a railway business development strategy needs to consider the timetable of the service it wants to run, the rolling stock and the infrastructure in a join-up manner, and yes, that is how we uh, go about thinking about our investment plans in Scotland. Um, we are not just talking about this, though. Um, uh, we have already delivered very substantial electrification in the last few years. Um, any of you have travelled through uh, from the east to Glasgow today, you'll, you will have travelled on an electric train if you came by train because there ain't no other option now. That wasn't the case a few years ago. Um, it's been a, a, a tremendous achievement to us. And we're at that point where 76% of all rail passenger journeys, 45% of freight uh, currently undertaken on electric services. That 45% of freight is really disappointing. And by the way, it's not because the terminals in Scotland are not electrified, it's because the ports and the terminals in England are not electrified. Um, and if we are going to make more out of the East Coast Main Line, the only way you're going to do it is by electrifying to Felixstowe and Thameshaven and various other places besides to accelerate those freight trains to allow the faster passenger trains to run on the existing network. I'm often asked, how can you afford to have such an ambitious programme? Well, let me turn that round. We can't afford not to invest in electrification for our network. So here is a you know, brief summary of our, of our diesel fleets, remaining diesel fleets in Scotland. Um, these, uh, you know, it will be illegal to run diesel trains uh, before too terribly long, I anticipate. Um, uh, diesels are uh, an important bit of how we will decarbonise transport in the short run, there's this kind of there's the diesel dilemma really. It's actually much better to have a passenger out of a car and on a diesel train than it is to be driving an internal combustion car and likewise uh, freight on a, a diesel hauled freight train. But um, this is the light, this is the, the, the sort of the age profile and the, and, the, and the replacement expectancy of our remaining diesel fleets in Scotland. Now I've got a choice and we need to make that choice now. We can either do nothing, which means when those trains, maybe we'll leak them out for a few more years, but when we withdraw them from service, we will need to replace them with uh, uh, technology like fuel cell trains, which is more expensive to buy, more expensive to operate, uh, and performs less well than the diesels it would be replacing. Or we can replace them with electric trains that are cheaper to buy, cheaper to operate, 
uh, deliver a higher performance and will attract more revenue. Which would you choose? Um, actually, we cannot afford not to do this and we cannot afford to wait to do this. We are struggling to get enough electrification done to be able to replace all of those fleets with pure electrics. Um, uh, and that's, um, that's not, not a surprise, but we are working to achieve that, um, but it's actually not, not, not straightforward to achieve that, which is why this is urgent. Um, so, uh, and I've just come back to the, and we absolutely consider, when making that trade-off between do we go for partial electrification or full electrification, we absolutely consider the importance of that freight capacity, and that just tips the balance in favour of full electrification of trunk routes. Um, so if you read our decarbonisation action plan, um, this is the picture it will give you um, of, of uh, the routes that we are trying to electrify. You'll see there's nothing north of the central belt um, currently other than Stirling and Alloa. Um, uh, but we will be, uh, 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 we are committed to the electrification of our trunk, or committed to developing. I haven't actually made the investment announcement yet, but you can see clearly our intentions. Um, and then what do we do beyond that? Well, we fill in the remaining gaps, I think. Um, but when, again, we're not just talking about it. Uh, in Scotland, there are electri there's electrification work underway now on the electrification of the Barhead and the East Kilbride routes. Uh, and there is development work uh, um, uh, uh, on the uh, route to uh, the Five Circle, and lines in black on the top right there, Five Circle and the Borders Railway uh, for initially um, uh, partial electrification, but please note the initially. And interestingly, uh, you may just see up there, I don't know if you can just, oh, oops, back a bit. I'm not sure if I've got a pointer. Oh, I have, there we are. Right, there's Leven, that we are, uh, colleagues in Network Rail are reopening that railway as we speak. Colleagues across wider transport modes are building the active travel links to go with it, so it's a joined up transport project. Um, but that will be built with the electrification masts in place at the time that we open the railway. We won't be using them for two or three years, uh, but actually it's cheaper to put them in now and it avoids the disruption coming back later. It's the right thing to do. If you have that clarity about where you're going, those are the sensible decisions you can take. Um, and it's not just about getting the perfect transport system. The Scottish Government, we like to use our money twice. We like to use it to get the better transport system. We also like to create the jobs uh, within Scotland that go with that. So there's a, an awful lot. Well, one of the benefits of a rolling programme is it allows us to create stable jobs in Scotland uh, with some security. Um, what will success look like? Uh, it will look like uh, improved journey times, improved reliability, additional services, and very importantly, uh, uh, a reduced net cost of the operation of the network. And we need that. We cannot afford the growth that is necessary unless we are delivering um, a more cost-effective railway. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where uh, members of the PWI and indeed the engineering and operating community of the railway across all disciplines comes in and I will hand over to my learned colleague, Mr. Ross, to speak a little bit more about those very issues. Well, you can hand over to me first, Bill, just, <laughs> before, just before we get Alan up. Thank, thank you for that, Bill. That was uh, a most enlightening and uplifting presentation, I have to say. Um, I, it's nice to be told that we're on the side of the angels. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we'll, we'll treasure that. Yeah. <laughs> 